So our next panel is called Balancing Access and Integrity Through Voter Registration List Maintenance. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce, we have Rob Rock from Rhode Island, um, who can probably count all of his voters on one hand. Um, Heidi Burns from o Iowa, um, who uh, we, you know, just hosted the, the NAS event. I'm very sorry that I missed the butter cow in person. Um, and Megan Wolf from Wisconsin. So uh, I'll let you guys take it away, and we really appreciate uh, hearing about your list maintenance process. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Can you see my screen okay? Good, and, and thanks for the uh, proper introduction, Michelle. I'm gonna talk to everybody about how we uh, keep our 10 voter list maintenance uh, in, in, in order for each election. So, uh, but this, <clears throat> uh, my name is Rob Rock, Director of Elections for the Secretary of State's Office uh, here in Rhode Island for Secretary of State, Nelly Gorbea. And, uh, you know, all kidding aside, this is actually one of my favorite topics to talk about, because uh, I believe that this is uh, one of the most, if not one of the most important uh, processes in the elections uh, process in general. Uh, certainly the first step in ensuring the integrity of, uh, of elections. So, and, and we like to uh, start when we talk about voterless maintenance here in Rhode Island and with the public, talk about how voterless maintenance isn't just about taking people off the voter rolls. It's really trying to make sure that everybody is registered where they need to be, uh, whether it's here in Rhode Island or in another state. We try to help in that fashion as well. So voterless maintenance is not just taking voters off, but making sure voters are registered to vote. Uh, where they where they should be, <clears throat> where I'm sure like everybody else are constantly uh, contacted about uh, dead people voting and, and my son or daughter hasn't lived at this house in 15 years and they're still on the voter rolls and why is that? So we do quite a bit of outreach about the voter list maintenance process and, and much of, of what I'm going to talk about uh, I'm sure is done in, in most states, but we try to do things a little bit differently in, in a few uh, small areas. So I only have, uh, I think it's three slides, but I'm certainly willing to, to go in depth during Q&A or, or uh, or offline. Uh, this first slide is, is probably no different uh, than what many states do with, with voterless maintenance. It's really, um, it's, a, it's a team effort and there's a lot of hard work that goes into accurate voter rolls. Um, and so, you know, for the folks that are non-election administrators on the line, just give a, a sense of some of the uh, state and, and other partners that are, that are part of this process. Uh, and voterless maintenance is clearly a, a team effort. And here in Rhode Island, I don't think there's a bigger player uh, than the DMV, our uh, Division of Motor Vehicles, uh, and cannot stress enough how amazing they've been um, over the last six years with <clears throat> things like online voter registration, automated voter registration, joining ERIC, uh, this data sharing process that we have <clears throat> with the DMV to make sure that our lists are as accurate as possible. And uh, like most states, I think voters in Rhode Island, uh, they're most likely to come in contact with the DMV uh, more than any other state agency. So. Uh, we were fortunate enough back in 2005 to have uh, an electron, we established an electronic connection with our division of motor vehicles so that when someone goes in to do their DMV business, they can register to vote. And each night starting in 2005, we'd get a file from the DMV that would, we would take and upload into our system. Our cities and towns the next day would process those, uh, those records. And I think we were one of the first states to do it, not the first, but one of the first to, to establish that electronic connection. And it made it very easy for us in 2018 to implement automated voter registration when that was instituted here in Rhode Island. Uh, we basically told the DMV that instead of giving everybody who says, yes, I want to register to vote, we want you to give us everybody that doesn't opt out of registering to vote. So in Rhode Island, we've got a uh, opt out AVR system here. So we've been, we've been doing a real good job of, of getting people to realize that they also need to update their voter information when they go to the DMV and we make it as easy as possible for them by essentially doing it for them unless they, they opt out. One of the other uh, cool things that we do with our DMV is a, kind of a data sharing piece um, where we get a lot of data from the DMV, uh, not so much you know, every night from, uh, from the voters, but from kind of their backend system. So we can do a lot of work behind the scenes to see if we can find people who have passed away or people who have uh, moved or people who have changed their name. And so we've had a real good relationship where not only do they give us data, but we're now in the process of giving them data back so that they can make their system even more uh, accurate than it is now. Uh, just a quick thing, you know, I would say at least three or four times a week, we get a phone call from somebody who didn't get their driver's license or their state ID in the mail. And they call us because our number's on the receipt in case they have any voter questions. So when they call us, we always ask for their address and we look it up in the system and we can see that, for example, if someone lives at 10 Smith Street, apartment 10 in Providence, 
and we look them up in the DMV system and they've got 10 Smith Street apartment eight in the system, we tell them, well, that's why you didn't get your ID because they didn't send it to the right location. We contact the DMV, they update, update their, their voters information and then get them their ID. That's a, a one-off and kind of freelance way of doing it, but we are working on a more automated way where we can provide the DMV with data that we have so that they can update their system if, if in fact they, uh, they want to. We also just started receiving uh, deceased information from the DMV. And while it's not as good as the Social Security Death Master File or our uh, Department of Health's Vital Statistics Office, there are people that contact the DMV when a loved one passes away. And so we're able to get, and that's just another piece of information that we're able to use to potentially update our, our voter roll. So we've, we've got a really uh, great process with our, with our DMV and they've been great. And, and I could say one of the strongest partners for, for voter list maintenance. Uh, just like most of you, we've got an electronic connection with our Department of Health's Vital Statistics Office, where every week we receive uh, an update of people who have passed away. We've uh, funneled that down to the cities and towns through our voter registration system, and we actually monitor the activity of our cities and towns to make sure that they are processing those records uh, when they should be. And it's the same thing with our Department of Corrections, uh, where every month we get a list of folks who have been incarcerated upon a felony conviction, and then another list each month of people who have been released from a correctional facility. And through our voter registration system, uh, those voters are updated, whether they're taken off the list or put back onto the list, if they've been released from, uh, from a correctional facility. And then finally on this slide, uh, the Electronic Registration Information Center, Eric for short, uh, an organization that we've really um, gotten a lot out of. We joined Eric in 2015. Uh, when Secretary Gorbea got elected and we received our first reports uh, in 2016. And, and this is where we're doing, we're really ramping up our efforts for voter list maintenance. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, we've really kicked up our game when it comes to ERIC reports and we receive them every 60 days and, and get that information out to the cities and towns so that they can process uh, that information. So uh, just quickly uh, on the deceased voters, uh, when we first got our reports back in 2016 for the first time, uh, we had over 1,500 people on our voter rolls that, that Eric had said were had been deceased. We obviously took care of those uh, right away with our cities and towns. And in our latest report that we received in July, that we had about 101 voters on our list that had passed away. Uh, and 98 of those had passed away in the last 60 days. So um, we're really uh, proud of the work that we've done with the help of Eric and a few other locations to make sure that deceased voters are not on our voter rolls. Uh, the in-state moves, uh, we, when we first joined Eric, we had about 40,000 people who had a newer address with the DMV than they did with the voter registration system. And that's what was the impetus for us to, to move to AVR because we felt that those 40,000 people didn't realize that when they went to the DMV, they also had to update their voter information. So we've done quite a bit of work to make sure that voters who move within Rhode Island uh, are updated here in the voter registration system. Uh, duplicates, we had over 2,000 in our first uh, Eric report uh, five years ago, and we're now down to under 200 per report that are updated um, each uh, e every two months. And then finally, we just sent an out-of-state mailing to about 28,000 voters uh, about a month ago, and we've already received over a quarter of them back, indicating that voters have in fact moved to other states and we've removed them from our voter roll. So I can't speak highly enough of, of Eric and, and being fortunate enough to be the chair of Eric, uh, not just a client, I guess that's a, not just a client, that's a, Hair Club for Men joke, but um, it's been it's been a great uh, it's been a great experience. And for the states that are not on board, um, I suggest doing it. It's done wonders for our voter file, and and uh, it's been it's been a great experience. Uh, this next slide is just a few other things that we do regarding voter list maintenance. Uh, many of us do online voter registration, which allows people uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to update their information uh, on our voter information center. Voters can also check out their sample ballot, a map to their polling place. Uh, they can track their mail ballot, um, but we also push before every election, we push people to make sure they go onto our website and check their voter information so that they can uh, keep it as updated as possible. The last thing we want is for voters to show up to a polling place that they shouldn't be voting at because they didn't update their information. So we really push hard out uh, our online uh, voter registration. Uh, one of the other cool things that we do and, and very fortunate that the secretary has taken this very seriously is that um, the secretary in our office has hired two internal data analysts, uh, a senior analyst and a junior analyst, who do tons of work on voter data. Um, we all know that we possess quite a bit of, of data in our voter files. And what uh, our two 
senior data analysts have been able to do has been has been great. Uh, they're able to take our file and look at it a million different ways to find duplicates, to find merged voters that shouldn't be there, even deceased voters. Um, and it's just, it's just another step in the process. It's another group of eyes that are looking at our, our voter file. And as a matter of fact, um, one of the data analysts just kind of figured out a little algorithm to look at folks who have changed their name uh, that make it very difficult to identify uh, a change because clearly a first and last name change makes it very difficult and it's even tougher Eric to determine that so our senior data analysts I'd say every week are providing us with small very small list 10 12 20 people hey look at this group of people look at these two records and see if they're the same people we see a lot of similarities and we're able to work to get our list uh, where it needs to be and it's been really great to have people who are you know who whose job is to actually look at the voter file and, and find ways to make it uh, more accurate uh, they've also, and you can see a little snippet here on our on our on the slide, have created a voter registration website on our voter information center. Every month, it's updated with the number of voters who are active, inactive, party affiliation by city and town, by senate and rep district. It's a pretty cool website. Uh, if you want to check it out, it's vote.ri.gov. Uh, under forms and publications, you can see the voter registration piece of it. But the media loves it. Uh, our voters love it. Candidates love it because they can see you know, where the new voters are and all that. So it's, it's really a, a pretty cool website. Uh, we do the, the national change of address, of course, uh, where we contact voters at their old and their new address to make sure that they're registered to vote where they should be. The jury commissioner is another way that we get information about voters who have, who have moved. Uh, Rhode Island law allows for a no vote five year mailing, which essentially allows us to send a mailing to anybody who hasn't, who has no election history over the last five years, basically a reminder that they're registered to vote and if they've moved to let us know. Uh, we send them to our voter registration uh, website so that they don't have to fill out a paper form. Um, but we did it uh, right before the, in the spring of 2020, before the, the pandemic, and, and we're able to update our list pretty, uh, in, in a big way from that, from that no vote mailing. I think we had about 150,000 people that, that were on that list. So uh, it was really great for us to, to be able to contact those voters. And it's also, even if, the voters still live where they are. It's another touch point so that voters know, you know, where to vote, how to vote, the information to, to go to the poll. So it's, if, if anything else, it not only does it help keep the voter roll updated, but it also helps to, uh, to know that voters know that we're here and trying to give them information. One of the biggest ways that we've updated our voter file uh, over the last year and a half are mail ballot application mailings. One of the silver linings from the COVID pandemic is that we've done, uh, we've sent out three times in the last year and a half, a mail ballot application to all registered voters in the state. Uh, for the June presidential primary in 2020, we actually sent it to inactive voters as well because they are eligible to vote. And for our November general and for the March special election that we had, uh, we sent them as well. And that did wonders for our list as well. We were able to find uh, a ton of people that were not living, um, you know, where they said they were registered to vote. And I give, I always give the quick example of the of the mother or father that calls us up when they receive this application and say, hey, my daughter hasn't lived at this house in, in 10 years. Why are they still getting a mail ballot application? And I say, well, what did you do with the application? They say, oh, we just threw it away and, and you know, it's fine. I said, well, that's, that's why the voter is still on the list because when you take an official election mail and you throw it away and you don't let the post office know or let our office know that they've moved, you know, federal and state law make it very difficult to remove someone from uh, from the voter file. You don't just get removed because you don't cast a ballot. So for our mail ballot application mailing, we put a little note on every envelope saying, if this voter does not live at your address, please send it back with your postal carrier. Please send it to us and we can start the confirmation process. And the next shot, slide will show you that uh, we have about uh, 95,000 people that we were be able to make inactive due to those mail ballot application mailings. So statewide mailings have done a great deal for us. Um, and before I get there, though, one final thing on this slide, we also do a, a precinct review where we overlay our, uh, our voter file on top of the precinct shape files to make sure that voters are in the correct precinct. We do that every couple of years because when streets are extended or shortened, we want to make sure that voters don't get moved inadvertently. Uh, so we're able to do that with a geocoded voter, voter file. And that's a bigger project that we're working on. It's not complete, um, but we have seen some uh, accuracies made to our voter list be uh, because of it. So those are just some of the ways that um, we're, we're making sure that our list is, is as accurate as possible. And this final uh, slide is it probably goes to Michelle's point about our very small voter file. Some of you are looking at this and probably laughing, but over the last uh, six years, we've taken off uh, almost 170,000 voters from voter list maintenance. 
Uh, most of them are from being inactive for two federal elections. And that's where I show our 95,000 currently inactive voters, which means we've pretty much determined that they don't live at the address that, they, uh, that they're registered at, but because of federal and state law, we can't take them off yet. And if they don't vote in one of the next two federal elections, they're, they're taken off. But just a, a quick anecdote, um, we had 521,000 people vote in Rhode Island in, in 2020 in November, which was a record for us. Um, out of the 808,000 registered voters, which is about 64%. But if you take out those 95,000 inactive voters that we've already deemed don't live at the addresses that they live at, but again, we can't take them off, our, um, our percentage of, of turnout you know, shoots up to 73%. So uh, voterless maintenance does matter. Uh, this, this screen shows you all of the, the work that we've done on it. Um, and we're real, real proud of it. It's, it's something that it's, it's hard to do. It's hard work. Um, but it's a, it's a team effort. I can't stress that enough um, with help from many of you in the elections community with, with sharing data, with help from Eric, our state partners. Uh, it's really important. And it really goes to the foundation of the integrity of the election. We can talk to, to people about a, a voter list that's as accurate as it's ever been. And I'd make that argument in Rhode Island. Our voter file is as accurate as it's ever been due to the information that we're provided and that we're shared with other agencies. So we're fortunate um, and, and we're happy to answer any questions about this during the Q&A or uh, happy to put you in contact too with our data analysts who have some pretty cool ways to determine duplicates and merge voters that I think can be helpful. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Michelle and Amy, for the opportunity. And, and it's a pleasure to serve on the panel with, uh, with Megan and Heidi and look forward to their, their presentations. Thanks, Rob. Heidi, I'm going to pass you the ball now. You should have the power. You are muted, though, on your... Now you can hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, asking me to serve on this panel this afternoon. And uh, I'm going to review uh, Iowa's processes, but before I do that, I want to speak to uh, how important it is to discuss uh, voter registration list uh, maintenance within the frame of voter enfranchisement. Uh, like, like Rob was saying, voter registration is the that initial building block to uh, a successful election, a successful election administration, and the integrity of all elections. And enfranchising voters allows the voter to have a very positive voting experience. But to get to that point, uh, we need to do as state and local election officials everything possible to make it positive for the, the voters. And that includes educating people, whether they're already registered or not yet registered in your state, on how to register and how to update and maintain their, their voter profile. And more that we can do to help the voters understand when it's important and, and necessary for them to update their voter profile uh, can go a long way in them having confidence in the entire electoral process. We want them to have confidence, not only when they show up at the polling place on election day, but as the, the election process is uh, ramping up and as voters are making moves or trying to figure out where they're going to vote, if they're going to vote absentee or uh, on election day, where are their satellite locations, um, where are their, what are their options for voting? Uh, it all starts with ensuring that the voter is um, in the correct precinct and that they understand uh, who those experts are, who those professionals are that they can turn to and gain that information. And as long as we are all working to properly maintain the voter registration list, then we're also improving uh, election administration, and uh, you'll see that in in how resources are properly allocated. If a, an election official can understand truly how many voters they have currently registered in the precinct, that allows them to properly plan and prepare their polling place. 
Um, it allows them to uh, have a, a better feel for how many ballots they're going to need to uh, order in advance and uh, how many precinct election officials they need to line up, uh, what to expect on election day as far as um, the voter flow and when they might experience those uh, peaks in the, the voter line. And then um, also it's important to help the, the voters understand that voter list maintenance is uh, required by federal law and that we all um, as election officials are required to use uniform and non-discriminatory uh, processes. We want the voters and those who are not yet registered uh, to understand that voter list maintenance is a positive uh, process. And as long as we all work together to educate the public uh, as to why it's important and how it can benefit them, then we are all working together to lend to the voters having a very positive voting experience. So in Iowa, Heidi, oh, sorry, gosh. real quick, you're not sharing your slides. Oh, uh, you have to hit share. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, That's okay. All that practice went out the window. <laughs> Okay, now is that better? Yes, but you need to put it in presenter view and then yes, you'll be good. <laughs> there we right. go. Okay. So in, uh, in Iowa, like every state, we have um, our voter registration system, um, but of course, like every state, we have some differences. So in Iowa, we have 99 counties and each county has a county auditor who is the local commissioner of elections. And they're the ones who do all of the list maintenance. So at the state level, we are facilitating uh, pushing information out to the counties, but we are not uh, actually doing the list maintenance. Uh, so we work with a variety of partners uh, at the state level and uh, just like in Rhode Island, um, the Department of Transportation here in Iowa is um, probably our top partner in uh, processing information. We have online voter registration uh, here in Iowa and so we work very closely with the Department of Transportation uh, to gather uh, new registrations and registration updates daily and, and move those out to the county. Um, we have a variety of list maintenance tools. And so we have our routine list maintenance uh, that's uh, dictated by uh, federal law as well as our Iowa code. Um, and then we are also working with ERIC. We became a member in 2018. And this year we have been able to move forward and position ourselves to utilize all of the opportunities within ERIC um, to do much more regular maintenance. So we're providing uh, fresh data to them every 60 days. And now we are embarking on a very ambitious program to start utilizing the various reports um, regularly. Initially, we will be using different reports, doing something with a different report every 30 to uh, 60 days. And eventually we will reach the point where at least every single month, we are utilizing a different report um, and being able to keep that, that data moving out to the county so that um, they're doing additional list maintenance on a much more regular basis. And then annually, we are participating in the National Change of Address um, mailings, and we now are um, annually issuing an eligible but unregistered mailing. And that is also through the ERIC program. Um, so we, we align that with the month of September, ideally trying to get that mailing to drop um, pretty close to National Voter Registration Day. And with that mailing, um, like with many of our other list maintenance programs, we work very hard to educate uh, the public. And we work with the county auditors and their staff. We work with service organizations throughout the state. We work with 
uh, grassroots groups who are very engaged within their county or maybe within a particular jurisdiction like a school district that might cross county lines. Um, but we're very much about educating the voters and then with the DBU mailing, those who are not yet registered to help them understand why they're receiving this information and um, what they should be watching for. Um, so that when something hits their mailbox, they're not uh, caught off guard or just tossing it uh, in the mail because they think it doesn't apply to them. And then uh, biennial, biennially, we issue a no activity mailing um, each spring after the general election. And that mailing um, is issued to people who did not participate in, in the most recent general election and have had no other activity on their uh, voter registration profile up to the point that we issue the mailing. And those persons then are marked and active, but in the mailing it provides all of the uh, information to what they need to do if, first of all, um, they, they did participate or they've had some other activity, they can immediately uh, contact their, their county auditor simply by returning that um, pre-postage paid uh, postcard um, or if, uh, if they have moved, if they have made a change, um, giving them the information so that they understand how to update their photo registration profile. Um, if, if, if someone's received the card in error, they're immediately uh, reactivated once that county auditor receives that information. And then another tool that we worked with Protect Democracy uh, to develop in 2018 is Vote Shield. And this has been um, a game changer here in Iowa. Um, we developed it in 2018 and uh, have been using it religiously, daily, weekly, monthly, um, throughout the state over the last couple of years. Um, initially, we at the state level were, were using it um, just to really start getting a feel for it how to compare the data. So Vote Shield is a secure web-based application that tracks changes to Iowa's voter rolls over time by regularly comparing snapshots of publicly available data to previous snapshots. So it takes um, you know, maybe a year to get a, a realistic snapshot of all of the um, ebbs and flows of the electoral process within a 12-month period. But then uh, we worked really hard to bring the counties on board. So each county auditor has their own account and they can go in as well and review the data. Um, so Vote Shield will track total voters, removal, um, inactivations, reactivations, registrations, re-registrations, updates, address changes, and changes to names, parties, birthdays, um, you know, as any corrections might come in. And um, the counties, what is really helpful is that they can review the data and when they see an anomaly that's been detected and flagged within their county, um, they have a much better feel for the activity that's been going on in their county. So at our level, we might see that a county had um, 200 uh, voter registrations over a weekend um, within, um, I don't know, maybe July. So it's after our primary uh, election and well in advance of our pre-registration deadline uh, for the upcoming general election. Um, so it might look unusual to us, but the county auditor, under, maybe in, in their county, um, some candidates were moving through and they had a voter registration drive in conjunction with um, kind of some uh, speeches that were being given on the town square. And so the county auditor understands why they had such a bump in uh, voter registration submittal. Um, so we work very closely with the counties. Um, it's also given us an opportunity to identify when a county was incorrectly inactivating some voter registration. Um, so we've had three instances where we've been able to help three different counties understand um, that they had somebody on staff who didn't uh, realize that when a mailing that the county had issued to voters was returned to them, that that didn't qualify as a reason to 
inactivate a voter. And so when we saw that a county had uh, inactivated uh, 120 voters within a couple day period, we reached out to them, talked through the process with them, and then they were able to go back in and reactivate those voters. And in the next slide, the next couple of slides, I'll show you just some uh, snapshots of what the, the vote shield data looks like. And then on election day, we have election day registration and we utilize e poll books in all 99 counties at every uh, precinct polling location. And these are opportunities for voters to either register new in that precinct or make changes to their voter registration. Um, particularly if they made a move within the county or within the precinct, then they're easily able to update their voter registration profile and then that data will come back to the county auditor's office after the election and uh, then get input into our statewide voter registration system. So I'll show three, three screens here for Vote Shield. One is a timeline view. Um, so here we're looking at uh, removal in the state. Um, you can see that the different colored lines um, correspond with the different age groups. And uh, this is data from uh, November 2019. And then there's an analysis view, um, putting out uh, different variables and um, giving, it, it shows over to the right some of the uh, different comparisons that the user can, can select and, and review. And then the anomaly view, um, which then gives the user uh, the opportunity to see if uh, uh, an anomaly has been detected or flagged for further review. And so, um, as I've already mentioned, education and outreach are so incredibly key to uh, discussing voter list maintenance and successfully maintaining your voter registration list. And here in Iowa, um, we do a variety of things. We, we issue the mailings. Um, often it's postcards with additional information that helps educate the voters and also um, provides them a postage paid opportunity to get information back to their, their county auditor. Uh, we always do a lot of press releases and uh, jump on any press opportunities, interviews, print media, uh, social media to get the words out to uh, county or, to uh, voters and the public so that they understand what is about to hit their mailbox or what they're going to be hearing about at their coffee clashes, um, as word filters out from the county courthouses, what's happening with voter list uh, maintenance. And then we have a handful of programs that allow us to work with um, high school, middle school, high school, and uh, post high school um, students. And a, a program we started a couple of years ago is the Carrie Chapman Cat Award, and that is to work with um, high schools to get their eligible high school students uh, registered to vote. And um, earlier this year, we had between January and uh, April, over 2,500 high school students registered, and we had 78 school high schools that participated, and that was an improvement over the previous year, and we keep working uh, with the goal of trying to get um, all of the high schools in Iowa to participate. Um, but of those 78 participating high schools, six of them were able to register all 100% of their uh, eligible students. And then uh, we have our Voter Ready uh, website that helps uh, Persons who aren't registered understand what they need to do to register and then the importance of voting and how they can uh, determine where they'll vote. And then uh, we have our Safe at Home program, um, the Address Confidentiality program. But then our Restore Your Vote uh, program is for persons formally convicted of felonies who previously lost their right to vote and now are having their rights restored. Uh, we, we initiated um, a pretty big educational program a year ago when the governor signed an executive order last August. And we've worked with several uh, service groups throughout the state to reach those persons who 
whether they lost their right to vote uh, just a few years ago or many years ago, understand what their opportunities are now and how to register. And I'll show um, a couple of things on that in a second. And then, of course, the, the other aspect is training our local election officials and precinct election officials so that they understand um, how to maintain the voter list properly and in compliance with federal and state law and why it is a, a positive effort and how to educate the voters and, again, the unregistered uh, folks in their county. Um, because we have the e-poll book and election day registration, we want to ensure that our election, our precinct election officials really do understand the importance of list maintenance so that they understand how to communicate with the voters who are making changes at the polling place. And so restoreyourvote.iowa.gov uh, has a lot of different interactive um, aspects. And one of them, uh, you can see my mouse, is this video. I won't play it here, but it's a short video that um, really helps to easily explain to a person how to register, um, how to determine if they're eligible uh, to register, if their rights have been restored, and then um, how to uh, vote, if they want to vote absentee or on election day. But the other thing they're very proud of on this website is the uh, resources section. And one of the most important pieces to it, I think, is this piece that says, who do I contact? Because the Secretary of State's office in Iowa is not involved in the actual restoration um, application process. So the persons have to work with the governor's office to apply for restoration, and then they will register to vote. We don't uh, just go in and undo somebody's cancellation. They just simply go and register to vote. But uh, the persons who have previously lost their rights and <clears throat> the people trying to help them get their rights restored and get registered to vote don't necessarily understand the process or who holds the key information or who does what in that process. And so we've worked with the executive and judicial branches and the various agencies in those branches so that they all understand what their role is in answering questions. And so we've created this very thorough um, collection of questions to help somebody go through a survey and figure out if they're eligible to have their rights restored and if they aren't sure who they can go to, uh, whether that's um, Iowa Courts Online or the Department of Corrections or the governor's office, there are a lot of different players at the table. And just like with uh, developing incident response plans and having um, a, a number of partners named in your plan, you need to let those partners know that they're involved. And so we worked very closely with those agencies to make sure they understood how we were providing this information and why they may be contacted and what kind of questions they are able to answer. And then just our uh, final slide here showing our voter registration numbers. We have uh, well over 2 million registered voters in Iowa. And since uh, January of 2015, we've registered a little over half a million new voters and over half of those registered through our online voter registration portal. And uh, then uh, just noting that over 2,500 high school students were registered at the beginning of this year. We'll start um, a new Carrie Chapman CAP program uh, this fall. And then uh, since the governor signed her executive order last August, uh, we've had over 5,000 uh, persons have their voting rights restored. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Amy. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Megan, I'm gonna pass you the ball now. I appreciate this opportunity to um, talk about list maintenance. Sorry for the technical glitches. And I also really appreciate the enthusiasm over this topic from the previous presenters as well. It was fun when we were um, preparing for this panel with Rob and Heidi. I think Heidi described this as, you know, something everybody should be excited about. And I would certainly agree, because I think there is so much to list maintenance and there's so many terms that we use interchangeably 
or just the, the terms list maintenance are so ubiquitous to elections that oftentimes I think that voters, legislators, and others who might have questions about list maintenance um, don't fully understand uh, what that means or what's involved as part of it. I even think there's some struggles with common language among election administrators and sort of understanding what are we talking about when we're talking about list maintenance? Are we talking about poll books? Are we talking about the statewide database? Um, and how are those things managed? Is it managed because of federal law, because of state law? And in Wisconsin, the answer to a lot of that is uh, state law. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I can talk a little bit about why. Um, so to give you a little bit of an overview and set the stage for how this maintenance happens in Wisconsin, um, the first thing that you need to know is that Wisconsin is exempt from the NVRA. And the reason for that is that we've always had same day voter registration, election day registration allowed in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, you actually didn't have to register to vote in all Wisconsin municipalities until 2005. And so because of those uh, longstanding provisions, uh, our state is actually exempt from the National Voter Registration Act. And what that means is our DMV, other agencies do not play any role in election registration. So any of the data transfers that we receive at the state level or at the local level are actually all um, prescribed in our state laws. Um, another thing that means for us is that there are only active voters on our poll list. So there are inactive voters in our statewide database, but you can only be on the poll book if you're actually an active eligible registered voter at your correct address. Um, inactive voters, we keep them. Nobody's ever actually removed from the system. Um, so even if you're inactive, you're no longer eligible, you're deceased, you've changed information, we still keep those inactive records archived, uh, but those inactive records do not and cannot appear on the uh, poll book. Uh, we actually have very, very few provisional ballots that are issued here in our state. And I think a lot of that is because, again, you can only be an active voter to be on the poll book. Um, if you're not yet on the poll book, you can get registered at the polls on election day at the polls. Um, but there aren't a lot of provisional scenarios. They really only have to do with photo ID. Um, and then another big thing for us, of course, I, I have to talk about this, is that we've got 1,850 municipalities that administer elections here. And 1,850 municipalities that have been charged by state law to maintain the list. Uh, so either the list being the statewide database or the list being the poll books. Um, so the state does do a lot to help facilitate getting that data to our local jurisdictions through our statewide voter registration database. And with any list maintenance processes, for the most part, uh, before somebody's status can be changed. So again, there's no such thing as somebody just completely being wiped from the list, uh, but before somebody's status can be changed from active to inactive, in almost every case, they have to be sent a 30-day notice before they, the clerk can do that. Next slide, please. All right, so who has the authority under our state law to make changes to change somebody from active to inactive? Um, and again, because of that NVRA exemption, this is all outlined in state statute. Um, and for the most part, the answer to that question is our municipal election officials. Um, so when it comes to deceased records, um, when it comes to people that are now serving a felony and are no longer eligible, um, when it comes to folks that are adjudicated incompetent and are no longer eligible to vote, um, moves that occur within a municipality, moves that occur within Wisconsin, uh, voter verification. So if somebody registers to vote um, and then they're sent a verification card, those are all done by the local jurisdiction. When it comes to the state, the statutes give us a few authorities to be able to perform list maintenance, but they're very limited. And there have actually been some recent uh, court decisions that have affirmed what our role is um, in list maintenance. And the two things that we're really responsible for are four-year maintenance. Uh, that one's confusing because it happens every two years, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then out-of-state moves. Uh, so as we get information from Eric about people that have moved out of state and registered to vote out of state, um, or as people let us know, uh, either other jurisdictions let us know, they have a new voter that listed Wisconsin as a previous address, or the voter lets us know, we're able to change those statuses in Wisconsin from active to inactive. Next slide. 
All right, so for us, what's the difference between active and inactive? And I think this is a big uh, misconception, especially with our state, because again, there's no such thing as ever being completely removed from the list. It's more, which list are you on and what are you able to do because of that status? There are only two statuses in Wisconsin. Uh, there's active status. Active status for us means that you appear on the poll book. Um, it means that you're recorded in the statewide database as active. It means that you're eligible to cast a ballot at the polls, and it means that you're eligible to request and receive an absentee ballot. In inactive status, that means you're not on the poll book, but it means that you're still maintained, that record is still maintained as inactive in the statewide database. So let's say you moved back to the state of Wisconsin, you got registered to vote. Uh, when you did that, a new active registration would be created, but we're also gonna pair that up with your inactive record so that all the history for your voter record is part of that new registration. So the inactives are really an archive of all voter activity that has ever occurred here in the state of Wisconsin, but that doesn't carry through to the poll book. Um, if you're inactive, you cannot cast or receive a ballot, uh, you can't request an absentee, and you'd have to get re-registered um, and provide a proof of residence document before you could, again, have an active voter registration record and appear at the polls. And we do have same day, election day voter registration. Next slide. So how do we get all the information from various agencies, from ERIC to our local election officials when there are so many of them and they've been given by state law the authority to perform list maintenance? Um, how we do that is we've set up a process we call registration list alerts. And registration list alerts are a process in our statewide voter registration database uh, where we receive data from some of those entities. So from vital records, from the court system about incompetency adjudications. Um, all of that data comes to us at the state and we then pair the data with voter registration records and flag those voter registration records in the statewide database for the local election officials to go in to examine the data that they've been sent, to examine the voter record, and to determine if it is indeed the same person, and to determine if they do have reliable information to change the status of that voter from active to inactive. Uh, so we really help to facilitate that, uh, that flagging process through registration list alerts it also makes sure that we're able to make sure these things are getting done. Um, as we send that data to the local clerks, we wanna make sure that they are taking action, that they are indeed keeping their poll list clean and notifying voters when something has changed so that voter has that educational opportunity to understand why uh, they're now inactive and what they need to do if they'd like to become an active voter again. And so uh, we help with a lot of that facilitating. I think from my perspective, it wouldn't work well, it wouldn't make a lot of sense if we were to ask each of the 1,850 clerks to themselves go out to the court system, to vital records, to obtain that information. Um, so we help to facilitate that part for them. Next slide. All right, so uh, another thing that we've been really trying to untangle for folks too is when does list maintenance happen? I think there's this perception that there are these huge surges of, of purges that happen, um, to use the common phrasing for that, um, when it comes to list maintenance. When the truth is that every single day, list maintenance is happening in statewide databases uh, to get ready, poll books ready around the states, around the country. Um, so things that happen here on a daily basis or um, regularly are things like death records. Um, so we get information from vital records on a regular basis. Again, we use that registration list alert process, uh, but our clerks also have the statutory authority to use what reliable information. And the statute doesn't really define that, but basically if a local clerk knows somebody is deceased uh, they have the obituary, something like that. They're able to take that action unilaterally to deactivate that record. They don't have to wait for us to send them the vital records report. Same thing for felons. Uh, we get that list from the Department of Corrections. We're gonna put that in as a registration list alert um, and the clerk is gonna make the determination it is the same person and they're no longer eligible. Um, the same thing happens, although it's a little more manual uh, for incompetency adjudications uh, that come in through the court system. Then when it comes to move, uh, the statutes say that the clerk can 
receive reliable information upon which they can actually move a voter um, or deactivate their record. So if a voter has moved within the same municipality, so within the same town, within the same city, the clerk can actually update that record and then let the voter know, hey, I've updated your record, we now have you here. Uh, if they've moved within the state, so they've moved somewhere else, um, then the, the clerk uh, can also deactivate that record and then that voter is going to have to re-register in that new municipality. And then of course, if it's out of state, uh, we're able to do that and the clerks are able to do that when we're notified by Eric or by um, another state that somebody has moved out of state. Next slide. And then um, the next batch is sort of quarterly or monthly list maintenance, um, the first of which being Eric. Um, we, since we've joined Eric as the first state that's truly NVRA exempt and doesn't have a tie-in with the DMV, we've learned a lot of things. Um, one of them is that more regular uh, acceptance of those, re of those uh, reports about movers is really helpful um, so that we can get information to the clerk about people that may have moved within the state or out of state on a more regular basis. So we're moving towards a quarterly process uh, with that right now. Another interesting thing about our ERIC movers is right now, um, if you are an active registered voter, but you've been flagged as potentially a mover with ERIC, because uh, again, remember, we don't have a direct tie-in with our DMV, so sometimes that data um, isn't as accurate as it may be in other places. Um, because of uh, that, you actually have a watermark on the poll book if you've been sent an Eric Movers postcard. Um, so when you show up at the polls on election day, if you're on the poll book, but you have a watermark that says, have you moved, the poll worker is going to ask you, have you moved or do you still live there? If you have moved, you're going to be prompted to re-register. If you haven't moved, you can affirm that you still live at that address by signing uh, the poll book. And then um, voter verification postcards. So every time somebody registers to vote, be it online, at the polls, in the clerk's office, uh, a postcard is sent to them verifying that that voter is there. Um, and if those postcards are undeliverable or the clerk has reason to believe the person doesn't actually live there, then those records can be deactivated and potentially referred to a district attorney. Next slide. Um, for your maintenance, so this is one of our main responsibilities at the state office. Again, it happens every two years. Every two years, the clerks are, every election, the clerks record participation. And then every two years, we take a look at all the participation in the state, determine who hasn't voted in four years. Uh, we send them a notice that says, you haven't voted in four years. Do you want to stay registered at this address? Uh, if we don't hear from you, you're going to be inactivated. And so um, if those postcards are undeliverable, if we don't hear from somebody, then those records are deactivated or turned to inactive status. If somebody does return to continuation, then they're going to stay on active status. Next slide. And just some quick data to show you our registration list alert process. Um, so this is what the curve looks like before a general election, uh, where you see we had about 40,000 of these registration list alerts where we let clerks know, hey, you might have a new registration, you need to merge with an old one, so duplicate voters, um, or you might have somebody that's deceased, moved, a felon, whatever it might be. And as we head into election day, we really work with all 1,850 to make sure they're addressing every single registration list alert so that those poll books can be as accurate as possible. And as Rob and Heidi said, a big part of that is education to the voters, letting them know as we head into a major election, um, something's out of date. And if you want to take action, if you're still eligible, here's how you do it. And I think I can stop it there and turn it back over to Amy, but uh, thank you all, uh, really appreciate it. And we'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you all. I have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, let's see here. Um, for Rob, do you find that the, the DMV death info is different from what you get from your health department and how does your motor vehicle department share that data with you? Uh, so this is a relatively new uh, a new thing that we're getting this data from the DMV. So um, we haven't done much analysis about comparing it with with the uh, with health. Although I can tell you that in a few cases um, or in a bunch of cases, the city and town didn't have the information already. Um, so we just work with with the town to make sure that they do their diligence, find the obituary, because there's no 
back up with the with the DMV data, other than just the fact that they've got a data desk. So we have to we make sure that the town does their research and doesn't cancel the voter unless they've got more backup than that. But it's just a starting point uh, to to look for folks. And then um, the second question: How do we get the data? So we work with us. We can in Rhode Island. We're very close, and we can share data via thumb drives instead of doing it. Um, you know, over email and things because it's got sensitive data. So uh, we're working with the DMV on a way to do that a little more securely, but we do thumb drives and SFTP transfers. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have another question for you here in the chat, which is um, what methods do you use to prompt voters to go to the voter information session center to confirm their voter registration information? Every mailing and piece of educational material that we have has our website on it, press releases, social media. Uh, so we just do as, as much of public outreach as we absolutely can. It's vote.ri.gov. It's a really easy uh, web link to remember. So we just we get it out as much as we can. Any mailing that we do has it on there as well. So um, really, you turn on your TV, your radio, open your mail, you'll, ha you'll have the link somewhere and somewhere near there. Do we have other questions uh, from NOSA members? You can feel free to unmute and ask. Uh, let's see, Rob, I have one other in the chat for you. Is your no vote um, five year mailer, is that similar to what Ohio does with the uh, Supreme Court decision that they had. Do you know? Uh, similar, but that that last piece is different. So we're not we're not going to take any action on a record um, unless it is returned undeliverable. Um, we don't, we don't do the no response, make a change to the record. It's simply a more of an educational piece to say, hey, you're registered. We want to make sure that you're you're in the right place. If not, let us know. But we don't take action if they don't respond. Uh, I see Jed has his hand up. Hey, everybody. So I have a question. I think this pertains mostly to Heidi. Uh, we we are also trying to use Vote Shield, and one of the ideas we have is to basically post everything online, every transaction online over the course of a given amount of time. So, like maybe a month, we put all the transactions online so people can see how list maintenance works. Uh, do you do something like that with Vote Shield? And does anybody else on the panel do anything like that? So, Judd, you're meaning um, making the Vote Shield results or or the analysis publicly available. Uh, we don't do something like that, um, but we speak about Vote Shield uh, very publicly and often. And so, anyone who wants to contact us to inquire about um, vote shield or seeing that information will work with them or the county auditor can work with them. Um, it's not a uh, uh, secret and all of the data utilized and uh, analyzed through it is publicly available. Um, but no, we don't have uh, like a section on our website currently that puts it to the um, public where they can just easily view it. We have time for one more question. Okay. Well, then back to you, Michelle, to close this out. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I certainly appreciate hearing about all the, the different methods, and I always enjoy when um, Megan tells us about her, her 18, 1,850 local election officials and then Rob just cowers with his like 39. So um, the, the process is very different as you can see with Heidi having counties in uh, Iowa um, and then the municipal systems. Um, and I think we're gonna continue our kind of process based programming for this afternoon. You should have already received your new link for the, the class that starts at 2.15 or the session, which will be how elections process, processes maintain integrity. So uh, Amy has already sent out those links um, you should have received it, um, and we look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you, panelists.